back with you. The Nader Narrative on Jersey First TV, bringing you a really fun show, especially fun for me because I get to bring you another member of the Jersey First TV family, a great show that so many of you watch, look forward to every week, Real Talk with Fernando Uribe. Fernando, welcome to the Nader Narrative. Elizabeth, thank you so much. I love your brand. I love your shows and uh, keep up the great work. Yeah. Well, vice versa, ditto to you. And we were really excited at Jersey First TV when we brought you on and added your show to the mix because you've got such a unique style. Um, first, let's start with your opening because it's the best. I look forward to watching that every week when you open your show. You've got great charisma, but there's a lot of truth to it. Um, you are a well-respected journalist, award-winning. Can you give us your little spiel when you open your show? Because it's a little famous. Well, it's funny. Um, I'm a big pro wrestling fan. So a lot of my pop and circumstance comes from being, a, you know, very bombastic and, you know, very expressive when it comes to my media brand. And, you know, it's just something that when I thought of what's a good intro to really do justice to Jersey First TV. And first thing I thought I was like, you know what, let me just use something that goes on on Wednesday nights during AEW Dynamite on TNT. And I just said, hey, it's Monday night and you know what that means. Because Obviously, it's on Wednesdays. And I just go through the intro and it's funny because whether it's my significant other, my parents, family, friends are like, hey, I don't think your intro's long enough, Fernando. And I just, and I laugh because I'm like, oh, what, do I need more? So of course, I, listen, I get it. It can come off a little obnoxious. If you don't know me, it can come off a little smug, but really it's just, I'm just having fun out here trying to make the audience comfortable because Elizabeth, what we, what we do on a weekly basis, you and I, it's difficult. You know, we're trying to talk about topics that are always, don't, aren't always comfortable to discuss. Yeah. We have guests on that maybe our audience isn't always happy with. So we want to make everyone comfortable. And why not by just being a little jovial, being a little, you know, just being happy. It's, for me, it's Monday. You know, I, I usually have a great weekend. I'm yeah. a big baseball fan. So my Yankees are still in first place. I'm in a really good mood. So why not express that when I do the intro? Yeah, well, why not? And it's great. And and I, you know, we laugh about it, but we love it. And, and the truth is, within your intro, you're telling us, really about the fact that you are award-winning and considered uh, a top journalist. And, and that's no joke. And you've done this for a long time. So let's use that as a segue to get into a little bit of your background, because you're always the one interviewing everyone else. So this is a chance for you to tell people what you do and how you found yourself with this show, Real Talk. Well, my thing about journalism, Elizabeth, it's been a long, long journey. I mean, when I, uh, back in 2011, I was asked to run for a state assembly seat up here where I live in Hudson County, specifically the 33rd Legislative District. And during that time of campaigning, I came across different local journalists, whether it was Hudson County TV, the Jersey Journal, the Hudson Reporter. And at the time, again, this is 2011. So, I mean, let's sort of, for our audience at home, take it back to what social media was like, YouTube. I mean, it was still kind of in its infancy. Yeah. And I had Hudson County TV interview me during one of the Hispanic Day parades during that fall season leading up to election day and the ceo right after the election came up to me and said listen congr congrats you ran a great campaign i know you didn't win but you know what do you want to do like it doesn't seem like politics is your thing it seems like you're more comfortable from a camera speaking you were so eloquent and just you know just had a lot of charisma and I, you know I, I was nice of him to say that and i said all right well where's this going and he said listen why don't you consider joining hudson county tv do a show with us you know, you can call whatever you want. I called it at the time the Rebay Express. And it was just pretty much reporting on Hudson County politics, interviewing people, sort of man on the street interviews. And I felt really comfortable. And obviously I did that from 2012 up until about the summer of 2015, Elizabeth. And I interviewed everybody from every mayor, every legislator. And they all were very comfortable with me, knowing that I'm very conservative, that I'm someone who at the time identified as a Republican. I mean, I'm still sort of a Republican, but I did that for about three and a half years. But then in 2015, I just got tired. I was teaching full time. I, I just started teaching full time in academia. I was like sort of burnt out. I, I didn't like the direction creatively where I was going with Hudson County TV. And no slight on them. They're great people. But I said, I need a break. And I was just like, let me focus on teaching in, in higher education. I did that for a couple of years. I sort of got, you know, the creative juices flowing again in 2017, started doing a local podcast called Talk in the Hudson with Blog Talk Radio. Again, sort of a, a radio podcast interviewing local officials, journalists, and that just caught on. And sure enough, I just started getting very ambitious working with the Hudson Media Group, 
uh, hosting a show called Talking Politics, which is you know on summer break right now, but you can check it out on their website. I was working with Insider NJ doing a podcast with them called Politically Direct. And subsequently, during that time, uh, a previous news channel had approached me uh, about doing a weekly online show live. And I said, okay, great. I feel comfortable about it. And it started right at the height of the pandemic, like right on June 1st, 2020. Wow. I was home in this very studio, home studio that I have. And I said, you know what? Let me take a stab at it. And I've been doing it. Obviously, that didn't work out with, with, with Eyes on NJ News. That was a previous news channel. They wanted to go in a different direction. I continued on just doing it independently. And I was still getting good traffic because I had developed a good reputation statewide with people, especially conservatives, libertarians, Republicans, and even like Democrats and people in the middle who liked my brand of journalism. So, you know, takes us right to up to Christmas 2021. Um, I got the best email I could ever imagine hearing from Rosemary Becky, um, from, you know, Audrey Lane, and of course from yourself. And, yeah. you know, you ladies saw something in me and I'm just, I've been so grateful ever since, which is why I've, I've continued working hard every week to get guests. And I get it. I'm a little bombastic. I'm very opinionated. But Elizabeth, you know that traffic is what rules this business. Clicks, views. And if you're not standing out and being unique, then what are you doing? Yeah, well, we don't want you to change. You are, uh, you know, very easily unique. And that's amazing. One thing I have to ask you before we get into politics, because it's clearly one of your favorite things to talk about. Everyone wants to know about the PhD. So we've got to talk about that a little bit because you're also somebody else in your day job. So just quickly talk about uh, that part of your life. Well, I'm a true blue diehard Rutgers alum. I did my undergraduate degrees at Rutgers in New Brunswick in the social sciences. Uh, Coincidentally, my very first job out of college, and I know I look like a bartender or a manager at a bar or restaurant, but my first job really right out of undergrad was being a probation officer working for the judiciary. So I was very much about government, criminal justice, law enforcement. And during that time, I was like, well, okay, let's uh, let's see what this goes. I couldn't envision myself working 20, 25 years in the judiciary, in criminal justice. Nothing wrong with that. Very rewarding career. But I got that itch after a couple of years of being away from school, went back to grad school at Rutgers in Newark, got a master's in criminal justice while still working in government. And I said, you know, I don't want to be a criminologist. And I've always been a political junkie for as long as I can remember reading newspapers, volunteering in campaigns during college, in graduate school. And I said, you know what? Let me follow my passion, which is political science. And subsequently, Rutgers in Newark at the graduate school has a great program, the Division of Global Affairs. Got a master's there in global affairs, got my PhD there. And I'll be very honest with you, it's it's one of those things where maybe, you know, in some sort of academic setting, I'm a little bit more of a snob, but I think in my everyday life, I'm not one of those people that has to be called doctor or demands it. I'm not like that. I think you and I have interacted enough, Elizabeth, yeah. where I don't wear my degrees on my sleeve. I might, you know, blast them all over my backgrounds, but I don't need that sort of reinforcement all the time. I'm Fernando Uribe. I'm a regular guy, working class person, the son of immigrants. But, you know, again, I'm very proud of my of my education at Rutgers in Newark and in New Brunswick. But uh, it's not something that, again, I, I don't hang my hat on it. It's not something that I'm very snobbish about like, oh, why well, walk into a room and it's like, you better call me doctor. No, I have colleagues, I have colleagues like that. And that just comes out very pretentious. And I'm a lot of yeah. things, but pretentious isn't one of them. No, you're definitely not pretentious. Uh, you're too much fun to be pretentious. Thank so you. that's that's part of your, uh, a big part, obviously, of your life, your day job, what you do. Uh, tremendous achievement. Now let's switch to politics in the show and some of these things. So one thing I think really fun is that you're Hudson County. I'm Morris County. Now, within the state of New Jersey, I'm just going to go ahead and say that you couldn't really get more different in terms of politics in a lot of way on a local level. And I think your show, by the way, how it's really different than mine is that you're very much local and state focused. I I, I tend to be state, but also uh, national focused. And so you bring in a lot of the flavor and the color of the uniqueness of each of the towns and the counties in New Jersey. So we've got Morris over here, Hudson over there. How do you perceive the differences in those two counties? Well, it's interesting because I always use sort of the analogy where Hudson County is Blue's Windex, and it really is. I mean, obviously, the Hudson (laughs) County Democratic Organization is, you know, they pretty much have a stranglehold on the county for decades. I mean, we had, for example, Jose Arango, uh, the chair currently of the Hudson County Republican Party and the state chair of of, of Republican chairs, 
who was the last Republican elected legislator in Atlanta. That was like early 80s, right around, mm -hmm. you know, around the time of former Governor Tom Kane. So Hudson County has been solidly blue. But the one thing that I, I would say helps my program, not just Real Talk on Monday nights, but my other podcast, for example, is that local officials are Democrats, but they're more working class, blue collar Democrats where they don't subscribe to all the woke nonsense. You know, mm -hmm. yes, you know, progressive Democrats of Hudson County and New Jersey try to infiltrate, you know, committee meetings and reorganization meetings. But by and large, yes, it's very blue. It's very Democratic. But when you talk to a lot of these mayors and council people and commissioners, they're just sort of like, yeah, they're blue collar Democrats. They identify with the Democratic Party, but they don't subscribe to far left nonsense. Like, obviously, they passed biology when they took it, whenever they took it in high school. And they know there's only two genders. Somewhere along the line, they took Economics 101 and understand what budgeting and finance is. And yeah. they're not irresponsible. Like, case in point, my, the legislator in my district is also my mayor, Brian Stack. You know, and he's the guy that I get it. He, he mobilizes well, but he's not, you know, and I know Brian personally, like not just because he's a guest, but we're good friends. He's a fellow Dallas Cowboys fan. We're dedicated like that. We talk off the, you know, on the phone a lot, but he's a guy that understands the importance of fiscal responsibility. He doesn't like to add to that. Now I get it. He's a state Senator. When the budget passes every June, Elizabeth, yeah, it seems like, more and more spending's coming. But I mean, again, that's more from the leadership in Trenton, whether it's the state Senate president um, or the state assembly speaker. I mean, at the end of the day, legislators, especially Nutsing County, I mean, they're one of many. And I think he's very loud and very vocal about representing his district. But at the same time, you know, he's not that Democrat, for example, like Teresa Ruiz, who's very far left, or yeah. others that subscribe or try to coddle you know, the wokeness that seems to permeate in Trenton. And again, that's where Hudson County is different, where it's still very blue collar and Republicans and conservatives kind of struggle to win elected office because they haven't in decades almost. Right. But they're making strides. And, 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 and I'm very happy to see that because we can't allow like this, the progressive wing of Democrats and, and all this woke nonsense to sort of take it over because that's yeah. that's toxic. Yeah, but there's so much to unpack in what you said. I, I, I just want to go a few places with that. First of all, Morris, obviously, more red has been red for a while, although trending blue, sadly. Um, yeah. So there's some, you know, some things that need to be done there. But I, I find it interesting that you point out on the local level that you don't see the Democrats as as far left, right? And I tend to agree with you that I believe, and I tell people this nationally, Jersey is not as progressive as, as those in Trenton would have you believe. But there is this disconnect between, I think, what the people want, and, and especially, I think, the policies that are really considered social conservative, that's still the blue collar Democrats would really embrace if you had kitchen table conversations with them. Um, I, I think when you look at all of that, there's this disconnect between what the people uh, would want as reasonable common sense legislation and what they pass in Trenton. I mean, there is a disconnect. So what's going on in Trenton, Fernando? Why are we passing such crazy legislation that you so you know, you, you just stated, I, most people are common sense. Most people, forget the party for a moment, don't want this crazy, woke, far left stuff. So what, what's the disconnect? I would just argue, Elizabeth, I think that activist groups have really gotten a stranglehold on the legislators. And I'll give you an example. And this is an organization that I roast as often as I can and not be out of malice because I'm the son of immigrants. I'm a first generation American. But my parents would be very, very versed to tell you that, yes, they understand the immigrant struggle. They, they feel bad for people who immigrate here. But there are organists like, like activist groups like the New Jersey Alliance for Immigrant Justice. Yeah, really cute name, very long winded. But at the end of the day, what they do is coddle illegals for a living. Mm -hmm. And I talk about that all the time where it's like these activist groups just find a way to get the ears of legislators, especially those on the budget committee, to sort of push gubernatorial candidates and say, listen, you know, we need to, you need to subscribe to this far left nonsense. And again, people get mad when, oh, Fernando, all you, all you engage is name calling. No, no, no. I don't listen. People in Trenton, a lot of people, Elizabeth, I, I'm always consistent. Yeah, stay over there, virtue signaling and hashtagging. I'm over here talking policy. We're not the same. I say yeah. that all the time. Yeah. Okay. Not just yeah. as an academic, but as a journalist that's, that's grew up in Jersey his whole life and has seen what has happened to New Jersey. The, here's another that should blow your mind. 2004, then Governor Jim McGreevy introduced a budget that was $21 billion in, in 2004. That was really high back in 04. 
recently, if I'm not mistaken, because I had state senator test on on Monday night recently, and I think it's somewhere between fifty three to fifty four billion dollars. Right. right. It's just there's just this recklessness of spending. You want to acquiesce to all these far left groups, whether it's groups that want to coddle illegals. OK, and I'm not into semantics, Elizabeth, like I don't care about undocumented or foreign. Like if you're right. here illegally, you're right. an illegal. Like, yeah. I'm sorry. That yeah. doesn't make me a bigot. It right. doesn't make me an Uncle Tom or a racist or a xenophobe. It just makes me someone that accurately looks at things. And right. I think people in Trenton really acquiesce to these groups. And that's why you get this bloated budget and all of these policies, giving driver's licenses to illegals, uh, you know, that allocating taxpayer dollars in the budget to create a legal fund to provide legal counsel to, for people here illegally find deportation. Like that's how tone deaf Trenton is. And that's due largely in part because of these groups. Yeah, you're you're so right. I think that's a good analysis and it is tone deaf and it's just lack of common sense. I don't know what else to say about that, but you know, it's interesting because then I wonder and I look at the GOP and I say the GOP in New Jersey, you know, what are they doing wrong here? Because we've got the Democrat party who, as you say, rank and file really, you know, they want, just to live a normal life that you and I want to live. They're not for these far left things, but yet the special interests has all this power in Trenton. And so the, you know, the legislators go, they, they, they start to be influenced by that. I know some are pushing back, which is, which is exciting to see, but so the GOP has an opportunity there to say to, especially those uh, in the blue collar, uh, the working members of the Democrat Party who have been historically dem Democrats for many reasons, or either they're told they should be, the Hispanic wing of the party. You know, the reality is that the Republicans have the ideas that you have, that that your family wants. So how is the NJGOP not doing a better job of crossing that bridge, opening their arms and saying, guys, look over here. We actually believe the same thing. It's interesting because this past Monday when I interviewed uh, Butler Mayor Ryan Martinez, again, a great municipality in, in Morris County, we talked about that at length where, and again, this is not a shot at Bob Hugan, and some people take it this way. People will read whatever they want to read into it. But I think what the NJGOP does wrong is not just articulate what is going wrong. We get it. If you have two eyes and you're cognitively functioning OK, and you at least have above average reading comprehension, you can understand what Democrats in Trenton do wrong. That's not the issue. We know what they do wrong, especially in high levels in, in committees. But it's about articulating a message on our end as conservatives, as Republicans, too, where this is what we can do better. This is why look at our, at our side. I don't think the NJGOP for a long time have been doing that. Yes, it's easy to just point out what Democrats do wrong in trend. That's easy. Yeah, it's about really, I think, the messenger who's going out there giving the message. And again, nothing against Bob Hugan or other members of the NJGOP, Elizabeth, but at the end of the day, like that Hispanic you know, Republican Assembly luncheon that took place in Hackens like a couple of weeks ago, it was great to see a lot of diversity, Hispanics, people of color. I mean, at the same time where they're homeowners, they're taxpayers, they know what's going wrong in, in New Jersey and in Trenton specifically, but it's about not dismissing races and saying, hey, well, this area is really blue, we shouldn't bother. Ryan said it perfectly on Monday, Republicans and conservatives should be emboldened to go into all, you know, 21 counties, yeah. into all the legislative districts and say, listen, look what happened last November. We had we made some strides in getting some Republican women elected to the assembly. And even Assemblyman Krista Phillips had a number that should scare everybody. And I talked about this on Monday, too. Only 39 percent of registered Republicans voted last November. I know there's some tribalism. There was some competition. Well, if you didn't like Jack and you're more Phil Rizzo guy or Hirsch Singh guy, mm -hmm. well, those people stay home. No. If only 5% more people had voted last November, we're talking about Governor Cittarelli right now. But right. Republicans just, it's like, here's a, here's a good sports analogy. The wind's to their back. It seems like they have all the momentum. They're going for the end zone, but they either fumble the ball, they go out of bounds, or they get stopped at the goal line. You can't do that, in this, yeah. especially in this election year, where Republicans can win some seats congressionally. And I, I just hope that they don't drop the ball, get the message out there. And I think that's really where the NJGOP often goes wrong. You have to hammer it home. Don't just say Democrats are bad at this. We right. know what they're bad at. Right. Talk about what we're good at. 
Yeah. Yeah. What do you stand for? Right. It, it's, it's very true. Um, you know, what am I buying if I buy you? Right. I mean, people respond to brands and messaging and I think we confuse them because they don't know what we stand for. And individually, I think we have the message, but at the top level, whoever's in charge, it just hasn't come across. Now the nation is facing what many hope is a red wave in November. Um, when you go talk to anyone in DC, when you reach out to national organizations, reach across state lines to what's going on elsewhere, you feel that energy um, and you definitely feel that momentum. Why does it feel different in New Jersey? Um, and do you think, and I, I guess I feel that way. I don't know that we'll see as much of a red wave. Um, what do you predict in November? And do you think we are going to sense that wave in New Jersey or will it be sort of uh, a little, let's say a little stream, not a wave? <laughs> well, I'll say this again, what Democrats do really well in New Jersey, Elizabeth, and you know this full well, obviously, is they, they go door to door, they mobilize, they're able to register people. And again, this is why you see these numbers. You see like a million, I believe 1.3, 1.4 million more registered Democrats in New Jersey than there are Republicans. Right. Yes, the, the, the majority of the vote is still independents, but it, Republicans need to do a better job of mobilizing, going door to door. Case in point, like what Jersey First is doing, for example, on Sundays in Newark. I know Mayor Martinez told me about that on Monday yeah. during our episode. Going to talk to residents, telling them that there is an option, not just the typical Democratic machine that is Essex County in Newark. But also, too, this is something that's very interesting. In the last month, I've gone to two different Democratic organization events today. Because I, I, I get invited to all these things. I go free of charge. I'm, it's great. I almost feel like a local celebrity walking in there. But it's funny because when I walk in and I hear speeches, yes, I hear, hey, we have to move the Democratic Party forward, for example, in Hudson County. We need to get this person elected because we need to move Hudson County forward to make things better for residents. Never once do I hear anybody mentioning the president of the United States. You would think that a guy who, again, got 81 million votes, mm -hmm. right, would be talked about and glorified to the moon where, hey, listen, I'm running because I want to work with President Biden to keep moving. Never, never once, Elizabeth. And, no. and, and the information's out there. And it's not just in Hudson County. Nearby, in Bergen County, you don't hear a peep out of Josh Gottheimer talking no. about, well, you know, hey, listen, I want to keep working with the president. The last thing Democrats want to do right now is evoke the name of the, of the president or the vice president. And right. because it's it's just it's such a systemic failure, and Republicans have to capitalize on that. And I when I talk to people in D.C., I mean, for example, this Saturday at the Blexit event in Cape May, you know, I'll be able to talk to some people, obviously, from different parts of the state, some from D.C., but it's about really hammering that point home. Yes, conservatives and Republicans do offer a good message, but it's more about the execution, the presentation. Sometimes, let's be honest, Elizabeth, we don't always have the best messengers. Yeah. I don't want to yeah, call by name. And that's the problem. We don't have the best messengers. And I'm not saying that we have to make every messenger Hispanic brown, black, whatever. I'm not saying that because I hate identity politics as much as the next conservative, but hammer the point home. And I just don't think that in a year where Democrats are really vulnerable, maybe not so much in North Jersey. And again, I, listen, I, I hope it, it, there's a red tsunami. I hope there's a tidal wave. Yeah. But I'm also being realistic. There are winnable seats in your neck of the woods, Central Jersey, and in South Jersey. Republicans need to do a good job because again, listen, in 2018, it was easy for those people to want to run and win elections because, well, there was a the boogeyman. Yeah. So what you want about the 45th president, you ran because you were able to evoke fear with the boogeyman. You can't run on that anymore. You have to kind of pull up your pants, folks, and to those Democratic candidates, and you have to win an election on your own. That's you right. Can't, you can't bring the president to New Jersey to campaign for you because that's, that's, that's almost a near disaster. Yeah, well, 19% approval rating and probably dipping uh, as as we speak. Um, you know, the, the whole Trump situation is interesting because, um, you know, we know how that plays in South Jersey versus North Jersey. And that's a show on its own analyzing all that. But one aspect of that that I think is really relevant um, to the Republican Party is this term rhino. It's, it's sort of overused, but let's talk about what it really means is that when people look at true conservatism and they say, you know, that means that you vote in the following ways or you stand for this sort of platform, uh, Republican in name only has been something that people are really frustrated with. And as we look at the uh, comeback of George Gilmore in Ocean County, and we see that change in the party where maybe the conservative arm is coming back, what does that mean for those that would term some people rhinos in the party who are running who by their own voting record let's be honest have not voted consistently with the conservative wing 
of the Republican Party. So is the party changing in that regard as we look at Gilmore and others potentially over the next few uh, cycles of elections? I would argue that the, the Republican Party, I think, suffers from almost the same you know, endemic that the Democrats do. There's a lot of tribalism in the party. And it just seems, especially within Republicans, if you don't vote conservatively and you are consistent about that, immediately there comes the rhino. If right. you're more of a libertarian, if you're more of a moderate, I mean, at the end of the day, it's about winning elections and mobilizing people under your tent. I would just argue, again, I can't speak for Democrats because I'm not a Democrat, but I would speak about conservatives and Republicans where, listen, and you saw this last November, Jack went up and down the state. Are there some things Jack could have done better as a candidate? Yes. And I articulated that at length last year on my shows. However, Jack went up and down the state doing the best he could, gravitating to and trying to reach out to residents, trying to win independent voters, which he did. But at the end of the day, there was so much tribalism in the party. Well, you know, Jack believes in this and Jack um, isn't pro-life and Jack isn't really pro-Second Amendment or Jack is not uh, you know, against woke curriculums in our public schools. I mean, again, it's that tribalism hurts the party. It hurts the brand, hurts the message where at the end of the day, Elizabeth, we are at a stark disadvantage. As I mentioned before, 1.3, 1.4 million voter disadvantage against right. Democrats. We right. need to win over independence. And you don't do that by being tribal. OK, is every legislator, both in state or federal, always true to their platform? No, we know that. Both parties are guilty of it. But the idea that, well, if you're not a conservative by my checklist, then you're a rhino. I think we need to get away from that. that again, that's systemic of tribalism within politics. And we have, yeah. to, we have to get away from that because all it does is hurt the party because we're already, listen, our backs are already up against the wall. We're already operating from a disadvantage. Why add to that by not mobilizing people and saying, listen, we may not check off all your boxes, but don't be a single issue voter. Look at the bigger picture about maybe getting conservative people into state office next year, like in 2023, for example, or into congressional races here or in 24. I just think it's really frustrating for someone like me who's a conservative, a real fiscal conservative, and to some extent, maybe a social conservative too, that, hey, I look at the bigger picture. I want to get fiscally irresponsible Democrats mm -hmm. out of office. And whatever right. that takes, I'm game. Yeah. Well, the flip side to what you're saying, and and, and I hear you loud and clear about the tribalism, and I think it's a very valid point. Uh, you look at the Democrats, they have a tendency to back each other no matter what. We have a tendency to you know fight with each other. But the other side of the coin, if if we're saying, hey, stop with the rhino, um, you know, talk is the other side of the coin is Trump, because if he ends up being the nominee in, in 24, then isn't the same argument to the people in the state like, hey, guys, this is our nominee. We have to get behind him. I'm not so sure that um, you're going to get, you know, all the takers you want on that. Is that not the other side of the argument? If we're going to stop with the rhino baloney and all of that and say, oh, we're going to come together and, you know, not not split, then what do we do if Trump ends up being the nominee? I would just argue again, and this is it goes back to my argument about tribalism. I think we have to sort of put it aside and say, listen, there are a lot of things I don't like about the 45th president. But policy wise, I was a fan. I was a fan of Supreme Court justices. I was a fan of economic policies. By the way, I was a fan of criminal justice reform, which I don't think yeah. he got enough credit on. Yeah. But I, I would argue that Republicans, whether it's the state party or, or voters, have to sort of look at, listen, where's the direction of the country? We may not be in love with this guy. And I'll be very honest with you, Elizabeth. I don't think he's going to be the nominee. Yeah. I think that what's going on in New York, not Washington, not this January 6th farce and clown yeah, show. Yeah. Right. I just... From people I talk to in New York that I have and from really good sources, I just get the sense that what's going to happen to him in New York, whether it's about tax evasion or some other financial discrepancies, I think that is what could get him in trouble legally. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, again, I'm not an attorney, but if he gets indicted for that, I would think that that might prohibit him from running for office. So I just, I'm really about Ron yeah. DeSantis. Okay. I think he's going to be the nominee. I think, again, would I like Trump to be the nominee? I wouldn't mind it, but I'm being realistic from people I talk to in New York that because of what's going on in the Empire State, an indictment could prohibit him from running. Again, I think that's what the law states. I could be wrong, but if that's the case, warming up in the bullpen is Ron DeSantis. And right. what are you going to say about Ron DeSantis? He's a right. great governor, right. governs very competently. I, I think that Republicans have to sort of take a look at, well, again, the checklist. 
What am I willing to? It's almost like I hate to say this, and it it's not very mis misogynistic, but all the single guys and girls out there, when you when you start dating, you look at your partner, potential partner, you look at the checklist. What am I willing to put up with? What am I willing to endure? As opposed to, well, these are the great things that he or she brings to the table. And then you make a decision. I think that's the same thing that voters tend to do, I would argue, should be doing when it comes to candidates. And I think that's what's going to happen if Donald Trump is the nominee. And even if he isn't, I think maybe Ron DeSantis isn't your brand of Republican. Sure. Think about the alternative. And it's scary. So keep your crystal ball out for a moment as we wrap up, because we're talking about 24. But I just want to go through a few quick things with you. So 23 is big in New Jersey. It's 120 seats. And it's the last time for four years that Senate is up. So whoever wins in Senate is there for four years. So are we gaining in Senate and are we gaining in Assembly in 23? Yes or no? Yes. Um, oh. I'll say this much. I think that incrementally you'll be seeing some gains and at the end of the day, again, it goes back to the premise about Democrats having a bigger voter registration block and just the way that they mobilize, you know, not just Hudson County, but the Essex County machine and Middlesex and, and, and Mercer and as well as Union, I mean, and Camden. These are very strong machines. I don't mean like, you know, structurally, I mean, at least from a voter representation block. I think that they do a good job of, of mobilizing. However, when you look at what Edward Durr did, again, and a shout out to Steve Cush down there, a great operative, getting him elected, his ticket elected, and you saw some gains as well. I would argue that Democrats are still going to maintain majorities in the state Senate and the Assembly, but it, that majority is going to get, continue to get shaved off, Elizabeth. I'm telling you right now, I could see some gains next year, maybe a couple seats in each chamber. And little by little, again, if Republicans are smart with the way they convey the message about excessive spending, all these pet projects, growing government. Uh, that's thats the message you can bring to the table and win over independents that usually say, well, my vote doesn't matter. No, it does matter. Look what happened last November. Yeah. They can get people to come to the polls. There, There's a lot of red meat that the Democrats have given us uh, and that Murphy has given us over the past two years. I mean, my goodness, if you can't make something out of that, I don't think you ever can. So, all right. So we gain a little bit in 23. So 24, we sort of talked about, let's make an assumption, whoever the candidate is, let's just say that there's a Republican president in uh, who wins in 24. Um, what does that signal, if anything, for New Jersey for 25? And will you predict now that a Republican wins governor in 25? I'll say this. I think that a Republican most likely should win in 24. I don't know what will happen. I hope it does. But if it does, I would argue that it's a really good shot for the Republican, whether it's Jack Cittarelli, whether it's Michael Testa, uh, whoever else, to win in 25 because what we're seeing, we'll be seeing the, eight, the end of an eight-year Murphy administration and what's happened under Murphy. And the idea that he wants to run for president is just foolishness because we all know that I get it. You know, Woodrow Wilson is the last and only New Jerseyan to ever win the presidency. And that, that record will stay intact. <laughs> the idea that I think that what Murphy has done to the state, whether it's through COVID, bad fiscal policies, that's going to that's gonna catch up to the Democratic nominee, whether it's, in yeah. my opinion, I think it's going to be Ross Baraka, the mayor of Newark. I'm calling that right now. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would say it's either between Not Mikey, Mikey Sherrill. Sherrill. Not Mikey Sherrill? I'd love to see Mikey Sherrill lose later this November, but yeah. it seems like she could have a, a chance to win. I think Paul, I think that's a race that people are very are very understanding. I think Paul DeGroote has a chance to unseat her. Agreed. Uh, I think that, that's one of those dark horse races, I would argue, that if yeah. people aren't happy with Mikey Sherrill and acquiescing to Nancy Pelosi and the president. But I would argue that Ross Barker is probably going to be the nominee and all we're going to be seeing is a continuation of Murphy policies. I think that's a chance that's ripe for a Republican nominee to come in here because I think be, there will be a Republican president and that could trickle down into a Republican winning the governor's seat, which doesn't tend to happen too often. Um, normally, yeah. a Democrats in the White House, a Republican tends to win in, in the gubernatorial. That didn't happen. I think in 25, that changes drastically because of the direction the Democratic Party is taking, not just nationally, but Elizabeth here statewide, like, I know Phil Murphy. He's a nice guy to me. But it, it, if you have if you have two eyes and you can read and you're cognitively awake, you know that these policies are dooming New Jersey. That's right. Whether it's, whether it's the budget, whether it's this sur supposed surplus. There's no surplus. It's not like we budgeted and, oh, my God, now look, look how much we saved. We didn't save any money. We borrowed it. <laughs> exactly. So I, I think that Republicans have a really good shot next year in 24 and in 25 to make some serious gains. But, again, it's about the message. 
get the right messenger out there to articulate what is painfully obvious to New Jerseyans. Well, I'm going to go ahead and say it's a great time to be a Republican or an independent in yeah. New Jersey. And I say to the Democrats, it's a great time for you guys to take a second look at us because uh, we'll get our act together. We've got some great messengers. They just need to come to the top of the pile. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in the coming years. But listen, Fernando, you know, I could talk forever. It's sure. great to hear your viewpoint of everything. And I know every time you have a new show, you gain another viewpoint from another really interesting person in the state. Um, so I encourage everybody to watch you. You're live Monday nights. What time? Uh, 6 p.m. Eastern time. 6 p.m. Eastern time on social media, on Facebook, but also jerseyfirsttv.org. And so to my audience, guys, go ahead and make sure you're watching this because you will have so much fun. Getting oh, no, into real yes, quick, please. I'm sorry to interrupt, but this Monday will be especially interesting because okay. I'm going to have Paul, I'm going to have Paul Mulshine. From oh. the Star and I know for a fact that he is not taking too kindly to my characterization of the Star Ledger, <laughs> colleague Tom Moran, and others that work there. Uh, it should be a very interesting episode on Monday because I'm not holding back against fellow journalists. Well, we love that about you and that you're willing to face the fireworks and create some. Um, so that's what makes your show so much fun. And I know you've got a very dedicated following. So uh, anybody who's listening now hasn't seen it, guys, make sure you tune in Mondays live 6 p.m. Eastern on Fernando's page on Jersey First, jerseyfirsttv.org. You can find it in a lot of places. Fernando, thank you so much. You know, we need to do this once in a while. Uh, so we'll plan it again, maybe after the elections and see uh, what we have to talk about after November 8th, uh, because that's going to be an interesting day. So Fernando, thank you again so much. And thank you for everything you do. Absolutely. Thank you more for the invitation. I'll come back anytime. Text me. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you in a moment. You got it. You got it. All right. And to my audience, guys.